children are just immortal beings in small bodies. They need to be held responsible like the rest of us. Promise to help get ethics in on this planet and universe, which is the basic purpose of the Sea Org. You need to stop committing these overts. This better not come up in your next session. I promise to accept and fulfill to the utmost of my ability the responsibilities entrusted to me, whatever they may be, and wherever they may carry me in the line of duty. I don't want to hear it. Write up your OWs. I promise through my actions to increase the power of the Sea Orc and decrease the power of any enemy. You can't just leave. Protecting the church is more important than family. Welcome back to the Children of Scientology channel as we continue exploring and exposing Scientology for children. Today, we continue our Cadet Org series, which is a look back at what it was like to be born in or trafficked into Scientology's Sea Organization as a child, given no options or safe off-ramp. Once there, your only future is to be hammered into an asset and a future Sea Org member for a billion years. On behalf of all children raised in Scientology, we appreciate you being here and helping us spread the message that Scientology is not appropriate for children. Scientology does not believe in childhood. This is dangerous. This is the entrance to the gold base, by the way, the little security it is. Hat there. So, yeah. so that, that picture that we just saw with all the internet, yeah, that one. So if you look, this is building 36 right behind them. That's the manufacturing building. The op right up basically in the upper left corner where you kind of see the hillside right next to those trees. That's yeah. where this main booth is that we're about to go to in the next photo. So if you go to this next photo, building 36 mm -hmm. is the one on the left and where they were down over on the other side of that building in this photo. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is those trees that you kind of see up there and then behind is the mountains to the north. But yeah, this is the main entrance. Looks like this is a nice property. And Scientology says never has there been better working conditions and everything up here. <laughs> they are, but there, there's a problem. There's a manager there. His name's Dave. Dude's a huge dick. But he likes to hit people and he will like make you work around the clock and he's hard to work for and stuff. So it's not super good in that way, but the building's nice. So there's that. Here's the property itself. You can kind of see all of, let me see, just orient myself. So you have that, the, you have the north side of the property that's on the left and then the south side of the property is on the right. It's a, it's about 500 so acres. You have the big RTC buildings that are kind of up, you know, towards the top center up there. And then the Bonnie View Estate, which is just kind of the upper left corner. That's that big kind of shrine slash mansion that they made for L. Ron Hubbard, expecting him to come home. That is where mm -hmm. all that stuff is. And then the rest of this is a little bit of international management. Everyone's heard of the hole, correct? Yes. If you look just just down from center to the left of the road, there's kind of this buildings there with a, a white roof. Those are a bunch of big kind of temporary trailers that were joined together. And that is the hole. That is where mm -hmm. they stuffed all of those executives in there that Amy Scobie and Mike Render, they talk about this in detail. That was the building that they used as the hole, which is kind of right outside of some of the music studios for Golden Era Productions is very strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but oh. it's an it's a nice property. It's in a prominent um, right. That's a, that's what's weird. It's in a prominent location, really, isn't it? It's not tucked away. the The trailers, I mean, or like uh, where yeah, they were. Keeping you can see them the from hole. the road. Yeah, you. So the yeah. the road, Highway seventy nine, that they had it basically kind of. It's now just called Gilman Springs Road, but it was Highway seventy nine, and you would have kind of some trees right there. But it was, I mean, they never let them out of those buildings. So they would only mm -hmm. uh, let them out at night. They would march them down by security down to the south side of the property. The building that's kind of in the bottom, the bottom most building with the big blue roof, that is the, mm -hmm. the estate's gardening garage, all the construction stuff. And they have some showers and stuff in there. The executives mm -hmm. were allowed to go down to there and use the shower facilities. And then they would be brought back to that hole and they would sleep under their desk. Yeah. And they have, there's a tunnel accesses on two different locations to go between the north and south sides of the property. So staff, like this is the hardest part about this. I'm actually going to be doing a video here soon that talks about a, a security drill that I had done in order to break into this property when I was working there as one of the executives to test the security or lack thereof uh, for this. Mm -hmm. And the hardest part about doing that was getting off the property in order to then be able to get back into it. So mm -hmm. yeah, it so is getting out was harder there. than getting in, you know, <laughs> yeah, without them knowing. Awesome. 
once I got in, I was kind of making a mess. So that's going to be a fun video for you guys to enjoy. But um, yeah, <laughs> that's we, awesome. Yeah. The more so if you were people doing the running program or being overboarded into whatever the sludgy water area was, where, where... just it's actually just off screen over on the mm -hmm. the upper upper right corner. <clears throat> the property goes out. This is all these green fields out here. There's a lake mm -hmm. that's just out to mm -hmm. that area. And then also there is a running track, which uh, a big palm tree in the middle, and then a, a circular track around it where you'd run Ooh. in circles. That's a cause resurgence rundown where you basically just run in, literally running in circles until you oh, feel better. Good. And they, the Pura facility was down there as well. And they also had a small lake that was, it was pretty nasty water, but that's where they would do the overboards down there. Again, it doesn't look like an, like the property itself, gorgeous. It is in the middle of the Southern California desert. You can see everything outside of this property is brown. brown. It is brown, mm. like scrub mm. brush and stuff like that. They spend millions of dollars to pump water out of the ground and spray it on these lawns. And this is why Hubbard said he wanted this place to look like a Scottish village. And Scotland gets a lot more water than the Southern California. So, <laughs> Can I so yeah, so they literally have like, they have like fine, a, a rough fescue all over this property, all this really nice grass that they are watering. Like, so the watering bill, like just the energy to pump it out of the ground and the amount of water waste and everything that there's just evaporating to keep these grounds That's super fun. nice for the people that it, this is not even a public facing facility. Like public don't come here. This is the upper level secret base. So how many years were you at the gold base? So actually at the base itself, I was there for about nine years. And then I had the time that I was out at the cadet organization, out at the ranch, and that was probably an additional, probably nine years. So all told is somewhere between 17 and 18 years that I spent up in this area. Mm. So quite a long time. And I guess a little bit of that is a little bit, a couple years in pack. But, you know, all told, I was at the international base for nine years working either in Golden Era Productions or uh, as a trainee for Religious Technology Center. <laughs> now, Mike, you mentioned earlier in this transition from the in ranch to the C organization and that sort of what was going on there. So you and this girl, Samantha, had a relationship and you end up when you join the C org, you're both in the C org together and you end up getting married, don't you? We do. Yeah. So here's a picture. This is one of these photos that we would take in around Christmas time. So we could, it was like a proof of life photo that you said to your family oh. around Christmas. Oh yeah. Before. I got many from my mother. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> makes so much sense. So, yes. and then this is my best, uh, Backstreet Boys, new kids on the block, but this is myself and Samantha. We, and this is what's interesting. That's why I provided you the marriage certificate. So we're living in Southern California. I'm 18 years old. She's about 16, 16 and a half years old when we want to get married. We had no, you can't have any physical relationship prior to being married in the C organization. There's no premarital mm -hmm. sex. You can't even like, you cannot like, you can't test drive it before you buy it. Like that is not mm -hmm. an option. We'll go to the re, you will go to the rehabilitation project for us and it is the end of your life as you know it, if that happens. So we so were So things that loud. you can do are like kissing and hugging and that. But that's yeah, you know, like, you know, I feel like that was true for careful. you, Miriam, but you can't do that at flag. Oh. And I don't know that you could do that at Impace either. Like, I don't think that's so maybe a thing. peck, like a kiss. You could probably yeah. like when you say kiss, you could like say poop, like kiss. Like, that's about it. You're like, yeah. there's no, oh, oh, there's no making out. There's no, no. And, like hug. You can maybe hug each other. No, no. because they heavy petting was heavy petting is the yeah, no, yeah, we was the, we stretched. Well, what you know, <laughs> we we we. we <laughs> We stretched. We were like, is this? And you'd have a conversation like, I think, or just conversation in your head. Like, I remember this one time, my boyfriend and I, like, he touched my butt. And like, for days, if not weeks after that, I was like, was that LTD? Because that's, if he touched me, like, he just put his hand over my, like, I was wearing a uniform. Anyway, mm -hmm. I guess we were hugging, you know, and making right. out. But we would make out this quite is the, heavily. The sex, the sex negative yeah. environment yeah. we were raised in. Like, you know, yeah. as teenagers and as young adults, like this is the situation we're in. So then what you get is you get this weird, like, as opposed to people like kind of having a coming of age experience, you're then forced into marriage at a very young age. Mm -hmm. She was 16 years right. old when we got married. Right. Mm -hmm. In order for us to do that in California, you have to like go to a psych and like say, hey, why the hell are you guys doing this crazy shit? And you have to do a bunch mm -hmm. of stuff. 
but for to go and actually get a marriage in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. it is much easier. You need approval from your parents. They have to sign some papers. So her parents and my parents had signed this stuff. And then you drive to Las Vegas and you get married. So we had driven, we had our marriage before we went to actually get officially married. We had our ceremony. And then we drove here and we got to Vegas late at night. We get the marriage license and then you have to go and have an official service. And we're like, okay, we weren't planning on doing this. We had already had our service, but you have to go and have an official one with a minister. So here we found the little white chapel drive up window. This was no shit, a converted McDonald's. And we arrive at the window and like, hey, we'd like to get married. And the minister like rolls up. It's this old lady. She rolls up in like this, like 69 Camaro. That's all like, like pipes and stuff on it. Loud as shit comes inside and then marries us in the window of we never got out of the car and we got and then we got this and we like rolled out this reverend pal chick yeah we got married in my mother-in-law's shitty car and a little white chapel drive up window in las vegas but y'all um, there's issues about divorces same thing opposite situation where they're sending people to mexico to get quickie divorces from the sea org because they're getting yeah. married because they want to deep birthing so you can live together and have privacy and not be in a dorm or have sex. That is the thing that's caused by this environment. It was for us to try to figure this out. Like, and then we had a couple of days in Vegas that we were supposed to have as like our honeymoon. As mm -hmm. two kids that grew up very heavily indoctrinated, you would have thought like, oh, they're having a great time. It was miserable. We had no idea. Oh, no. We didn't know each other. We didn't know one another. Oh, no. We didn't sexually, we had no idea what we were doing. Not, to, I don't want to get too TMI about it, but we were not mm -hmm. able to, you mm -hmm. know, so like awkward, like, connect. yeah, we weren't able to connect personally mm -hmm. and sexually and stuff for months. It was mm -hmm. very like, it was like, neither of us knew what the hell to do. Uh, and finally we worked it out and you know, and all this, but it was uh, like, there's no birds and the bees conversations. There's no mentoring by your parents. The stuff just doesn't exist. And this is where we found ourselves. And it was. It was strange. The kids at the in ranch seemed to be particularly repressed in the area. At the pack mm -hmm. ranch, we there were still like rules, strict rules and stuff like that. But we pushed boundaries, I think, a little bit more. There were yeah, some kids I that messed around like that and they got in a lot of trouble, like oh, made examples yeah. of in mm -hmm. a very embarrassing. It was embarrassing to watch, let alone have that happen to you. Dude, that flag, mm -hmm. you'd be on the RPF in a heartbeat. That there were bad. so many yeah. kids sent to the RPF for heavy petting mm -hmm. of a varying age range blends, but just for kissing or making out or touching each other was an RPF assignment. Like it was totally. And just what you were just mm -hmm. saying about not having any birds and the bees conversation. Uh, one of our earlier partners, Amanda Ray, she found out about sex and the birds and the bees from her auditor. Like she didn't even find out from her parents. Like she had questions about menstruating or masturbation or sex or uh, like making out with a partner. She's a public kid. She did not get it from her parents. It's so mm -hmm. stigmatized and bizarre. And especially in the Sea Org and especially at the Ent Ranch, I would imagine. Oh, at the Ent Ranch, mm -hmm. like they would be, they would have, you know, of, the, of course, these overts and withholds, they have you write up all the time. And they would interrogate kids out when they're writing up their overts and withholds and make them write up all the times that they had masturbated or something like that. It was the mm -hmm. most sex negative area. And th then they would make examples out of them in front of the other kids after they had written these things up. So like the amount of fuckery that went on with people's minds when they were young kids on this was bad. There were some kids that like straight up didn't care and their hormones took over. I was terrified of it. And so was Sam. And we never messed around. Like quite literally, we were engaged to get married before we like, like actually like kissed more than like a peck on the cheek. We were like, <laughs> we were having a conversation like, hey, we're going to go to Las, Las Vegas and get like married like two weeks from now. We've never really kissed. And mm -hmm. we're like, we don't know what the fuck we're doing anyway. So that's how heavily indoctrinated and controlled we were. You were scared to do that. There was no resourcing there in order to do that in a positive way, in order to create a safe space where there was any ability to have a conversation about any of these things with not heavy retribution. You know, what's heavy. funny and these policies came to be on the ship because they originally had no rules. And so there were a lot of free sex and swapping of partners going on the Apollo in these early ships in the early Sea Org days. And so he started to create these rules about 2D situations and 2D ethics. And, and then he would pull them back and go, no, I'm not going to control the 2D. But wait, yes, I am. You can't have a 2D with a public person. Like, there was all this push and pull about it. And what's interesting is that it flowed down to children at a certain point 
and it became so stigmatized. I was listening to this dude who's talking about having a sexual drive as a young teenager in the Sea Org and that he was so stigmatized about having an erection. They were telling him he was an ape because he had an erection and telling him mm -hmm. that it, you know, it was him not being in control of his body. And it was like, it was beneath him and it was degraded and all these things. And so he had to think horrible, disgusting thoughts so that he could control his erection. He's only like 15 or 16 years old trying to understand hormones and what's going on with him. And he's being taught that it's dirty and disgusting. And so he figures out a way to cause the erection to go away by thinking bad thoughts like of cockroaches and murders and gross things. And so now as an adult with his wife, all he does is go through this cycle of roaches and murder and stuff every time he tries to have an erection. And it's so gross. It's just so gross. Yeah. I, There's a lot of I dysfunction built into it. And a lot of dysfunction yeah. built into it. That's an understatement. You were saying before, earlier when we were um, chatting, is that you were you thought through this relationship, you would have this, you, you'd still be able to have a happy story for yourself in mm -hmm. spite of, yeah, the situation that you were in. And I think that was true for so many of us as well. It definitely was. And, and I think that's what I was trying, I was hoping for on why I kind of decided to go all in on being in the Sea Org and then trying to then be in this relationship with my, with my ex-wife, Sam was I was trying to go all in on something so that I had as much of the white picket fence as I wanted in my mind. This mm -hmm. was my only way to try to get it was to be a successful Seerg member and whatever that took in order to do that. And then also to try to be there for this person that I very much cared about very much. And yeah, here is our, our wedding. If, when I look at this photo, I see children, not just the mm -hmm. children around the edges that were there. Like I, like I was 18 years old and the girl that I married, 16 year old, like she, we're young. There's, we yeah. should, if my daughter was getting married, you know, and at 16, like they would, they, there's no way that would happen. But here, there's a lot going on in this photo. We need to probably talk about what's going on mm -hmm. here. Here, let me start around the edges. Over on the right side, we probably heard this name bounce around a little bit. A gentleman by the name of Bill Dendu. Bill Dendu was in the mm -hmm. marketing department, worked with uh, Ronnie Miscavige and Jeff Hawkins. He was kind of one of the executives. Mm -hmm. He was not a creative personality. He was an executive and personality. So Bill was there. And then down in the bottom left corner, you can see a little, a little girl with kind of thin blonde hair. That's kind of wild. Any idea who that might be? Laura. Is that Laura? That's Laura. Oh, I don't even know that she yeah, knows that she was there. I think she was our flower girl. She's looking um, at the cake oh, so longingly. She's, she's sitting there and she's probably six, oh, uh, six or seven years old. She's a little. But that's Laura. And then my mother, Rosemary, is right there on the left side. And then right here in the middle, this is a gentleman that everyone probably knows, IS Freedom Medal winner and huge bottle of spray cheese, Jeff Pomerantz. <laughs> he is all of the cheese. Bill might have been the minister, but Jeff was there too because, you know, both my mother and Samantha's mother, Stephanie, is just over her right shoulder there. In the back, kind of the, the redhead with the tan, that's Stephanie, her mother. But yeah, that was right in the, the facility called the Tavern, which is, they would use for VIPs at Golden Arrow Productions. That's where we did the marriage. It's a beautiful scene. And I love, love, love this staged photo that you have on the right-hand side. I don't, it looks like a professional photo shoot and i just think it's i think like brilliant. it was like the lrh photographers mm -hmm. like did the photos for us and stuff they would usually do our so weddings like jeff baker the guy that shoots you know david miscavige at the events did the photos so like they Sick. they're great you know and we uh -huh. did this great little ceremony at the end of the ceremony we weren't married officially Scientology this... ceremony we had to get sec checks before we could go and go on leave to do this and one of the questions were do you plan to go out 2d and that is a real <laughs> yes, we do. question to ask. I'm like, I don't know what to, I don't know how to answer this. And they're like, well, how could you go out to D? I was like, well, I guess we're not going to be officially married while we're driving to Las Vegas. Like we yeah. know what the hell we're doing. So I was on the RPF at 15 with Stephanie and Chris Silcox at Flag, and they were in the tech unit and I love them both dearly. And Stephanie was awesome. And she talked about her daughter all the time, who was in the nursery there at the time. And Jeff Pomerantz became engaged to a public girl that I was very close with, 14 years old. He was 41 or 42. 
that he picked up because the Hourglass restaurant at the Fort Harrison Hotel was really quite a pickup joint for visiting public men to pick up young young girls. Just the whole time Sick. I was there. Because there because age was a consideration. Because we were just Thetans and small bodies, it didn't matter. And so men like that took advantage of young girls and it it never ended well. I'll just tell you that relationship did not end well. She ended up on the streets of LA after living with him and became drug addict, prostitute, horrible situation. So Medal of Freedom winner. Yay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's child he's predator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of person that Scientology has. And this is a so going to this is now uh, probably a photo from I'm guessing around two two thousand one, maybe two thousand two probably right before I ended up blowing and leaving. Um, and mm-hmm. this was kind of the, around the time where um, I would have then left. So this is probably within a year or two of that. So at this point, I was no longer an RTC trainee. I was working in manufacturing. Uh, I was originally making the e-meters. I was in charge of the plastic enclosures. I would make all those. And then, and then at some point, I started actually running the on-demand print shop at Golden Air Productions for all of the lectures. So when you would when people would order stuff, we'd print up the materials in all the different languages. And I was running that shop and the straw that broke the camel's back was twofold on why I ended up leaving. One, I was working. I think I was, it was common for us to work around the clock. And I was probably on either one of these all nighters where I'd been up really late and we're laminating things in the production line. It was set up by the people from the church of spiritual technology, a guy named Russ Bellin and his assistant, Michelle Wheelis. And the laminating process didn't work properly and we were having to cut it slightly differently and it was taking a little bit longer. And Dave Miscavige walks in and he sees that we're doing something different other than what we were supposed to do based off of the equipment that was set up. And I explained to him like, sir, this production line doesn't quite work correctly. We're having to do these things a little bit different. And he's like, he said that I was squirreling the production lines and he should beat the shit out of me right here. The reason he didn't beat the shit out of me is probably twofold. One, he was only with himself and Larice. So yeah, he's a lot shorter than me and I could like, but usually when he goes physical on people, he's in a room with a lot of people that are going to protect him. So he's not going to do that one-on-one. And he was only there with a Larice that's about his same size. And then a short time before that is when Dave Miscavige did hit Mark Headley and Mark Headley turned around and was about to beat the shit out of Dave. And Dave realized Mm -hmm. if he keeps messing with these like young 20 something year old guys who are Mm -hmm. like a lot bigger than him and stronger than him, he's probably going to get fucked up. So Mm -hmm. he just then resorted to a lot of threatening and he was, Mm -hmm. he didn't, he never physically hit me. He, I had a lot of bad conversations with him about, and it was all about him asserting dominance and, you, you can never do anything right. And that's just how it is. So I started over the course of the, the last couple of years, realizing that the emperor in fact had no clothes mm-hmm. and I was disillusioned with him. But the thing that actually made it, I was still there because I was dedicated to a marriage that was a total sham living with mm-hmm. Samantha. And I have nothing bad to say about Sam. I, mm-hmm. I wish she was able to leave. Uh, I have very much moved on with my life. I have an amazing life now with an unbelievable wife and and three beautiful Mm. children. But in, I'm looking through this through the lens of Mike from back then. So I just want to kind of frame that out. I think that's really important, Mike, because it, it comes from honesty. If you can talk about it, how you thought and felt and what your ideas were then, that, that creates an honest story. It's, really important to paint the full picture and you know facts don't change but thoughts and feelings and perspectives do and that's really it's that's important part of storytelling Mm -hmm. yeah so the already in our marriage on two occasions probably early in our marriage probably within the first year or so probably year to year and a half samantha got pregnant and we were put in the situation that we had to decide if we were going to get offloaded from the int base. And when you get offloaded from the int base, you're supposed to be declared a suppressive person. There's specific advices that say, if you leave the int base, you're a suppressive period. So that was this whole thing of like, not allowed to have kids that we had talked about the whole thing that Guillaume LeServe had signed. We're now in a situation of, if we want to leave, we're going to be declared Samantha's, as we've already established, her family's very 
very well entrenched in the Sea Organization. And for her to, she has nothing, she has no part of her life that is not the Sea Organization. Her father had left and he's living in Waco, Texas or something, but she didn't have any desire to go there. And, and it never, for the first time that we were in, put in the position of having to terminate the pregnancy, there was no options other than you need to take care of this. I remember, and, th and this is a hot topic issue socioeconomically and for women's rights in the country and in the world. And I would say I, in terms of my feelings about it, this is how I feel with respect to my situation. But I feel that we were put in a situation where we had no other choice but to terminate the pregnancy. Yeah. And I'm not, and I am unhappy about that now, but I'm not unhappy mm -hmm. that I don't, that I'm glad that I don't have kids that are tangled up in the situation of one parent being in the C organization, the other parent not being in the C organization, because yeah. I know what that did to me. I wouldn't want that mm -hmm. on anybody, but we did go through the thing both early in our marriage and then later around the same time where she got pregnant and we had to terminate the pregnancy. The first one I drove her to, and that was very hard. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of protesters outside with a very bunch of nasty signs, which are disgusting to look at and people that are in that situation. That is not good for them psychologically to have to see those things. Whether a person agrees with it or not, I think in terms of where I stand on the subject is it is a complex subject that it doesn't have an easy answer. There's both, there could be both yes and no, depending on the situation, but I know that it's not some, it's not a decision that should be made by the organization that you work for. I will, I will stand hard on that. I think mm -hmm. it's fucking horrible in that respect. Is a, mm -hmm. There's so, no right answer. It's an incredibly personal decision. And it's an incredibly painful decision. And you will wonder whether you made the right choice for the rest of your natural life, like literally. And for an organization to write a policy that eventually became anyone that leaves because they want to have a child, which had, had been a policy for some time. Oh, if you get pregnant, you must leave. They eventually changed it to, you're a criminal who just wants to blow using the excuse of wanting to have a family, but it's really your sins and your crimes that are causing you to leave. And so you will be handled with heavy ethics. Like it became that you were, it was just criminalized. It was criminalized yeah. to get pregnant and choose to want to have a baby. Mm -hmm. It was, and, and I'll even double down to say it was not only criminalized, but it was weaponized in order to mm -hmm. keep you in servitude mm -hmm. to their organization. So. Mm -hmm. And that is the actual value of human life that this organization places. Like you can mm -hmm. see that is the humanity right there from my perspective. So we had already been through that as a couple. Unwaveringly, I was still dedicated to my ex-wife, Samantha. And mm -hmm. she came to me one day. She was a makeup artist at Golden Air Productions. And she was responsible for when David Miscavige would need a haircut, they would have a professional hairdresser that would come up from LA, a guy named LaVon unbelievably like kind of hairdresser of the stars kind of thing. And he would come up and he would cut the, cut David Miscavige's hair for, you know, several hundred dollars a haircut or, and then he would cut the RTC, um, ladies hair, I think was like $80 a haircut for them. But it was, you know, they would, mm -hmm. he would make good money. He would come up on a weekend. He'd do it on a Sunday. He would do the haircuts and all that. Well, well, Dave called down one night. He's like, Hey, I want, or Larice called down for Dave. Dave doesn't fucking call anybody. Dave has people call and said, Dave would like to know if LeVon wants him to wash his hair. He called down to a hairdresser that they had come up that is in a hair, like a makeup studio that has two hair wash stations built into the fucking room. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the hairdresser, you'd be surprised at what he said. He said, no, that's fine. He can just come down. We'll take care of it. Dave heard that he doesn't need to get his hair washed. So he comes down. LaVon's like, okay, please have a seat. I'm going to wash your hair. And he washes his hair. He cuts it. So it has that big ass bouffant hairstyle that gives him an extra three <laughs> inches so that you know, so when he's four foot 13, he gets every inch that he can possibly manage out of it. And then afterwards, because he was made to wash his hair and the guy washed it when he came down there, Samantha got absolutely ripped by Dave, by Shelly and by Larice on what an absolute piece of shit she was for, for making this guy wash his hair when he specifically didn't want that that night. And she, when she came home that night, 
she was in absolute tears to me. And she's like, oh, I don't know what to do. This happened. And she's like, we should blow. We should get out of here. And I was like, fuck yeah, let's go. I'm like, let's pack a bag, get out of here. I've been wanting to leave and join the military my whole freaking life. We can definitely, I can, we can make a life together. We can get out of here. And she thought about it for a second. And she's like, if we end up leaving, I'm going to end up coming back and we'll just end up getting divorced. And that's um. what she told me. So that for me, a light switch just, whoop, it flipped. I was, I had a completely different understanding of what our relationship was. I thought we were there unconditionally for one another. And mm -hmm. I found out that wasn't true. Yeah. So it was kind of on a spur of the moment, a couple of days later that I decided while I was out on doing one of the print jobs that I, I just sat there in the car waiting for a bit. And I was just like, I'm leaving. I can't take it anymore. I'm out of here. And I just drove to the airport and I left. I've watched some different interviews with people who have gotten out of North Korea or defected from a communist country in terms of you're like literally leaving everyone and everything that you've known because you don't mm -hmm. want to be there anymore. And you're hoping for a better existence, but it's very unclear if it'll actually happen or not. That is what it felt like. I was 27 years old with a, a GED no credit history, no money. I had a, a shared credit card that Samantha and I had together. I was able to buy a plane ticket with, and I didn't even have a bag packed and I just left and then was able to kind of get back in contact with my father. Once I kind of arrived at the other end on where I was traveling to, and then they declared me. Here's a suppressive person to declare. The one thing I'm kind of disappointed about is that it's not on goldenrod paper. They literally put it on white paper, those cheap assholes. It could have at least been on gold rod. Like anyway, like the, they wouldn't even spring for the extra uh, five cents. So a suppressive person declare Michael Brown, former CERG member is hereby declared a suppressive person. He deserted his post within the church on 17 October, 2003. Yay me 20 years. Hey, um, my name is Mike. I'm a former CERG member. You know, I'm here at a support group. 20 yeah, years, totally. You know, <laughs> under false pretenses that he was doing a job out in the field. I actually was. When in reality, he was secretly planning to leave the organization for some time and making preparations to do so. I made so many preparations. All I had was a coat and my Oakley sunglasses and fucking nothing else, which I'm not a very good preparer if that's the case, which I guarantee I am. Um, planning to leave the organization for some time and preparations to do so clearly in violation of church policy. He knew full well the consequences of his actions and the policies applied on the matter yet has not done anything to standly handle his condition. Okay. Yeah. Per HCOB 31 December 1959 are blow-offs. People leave because of their own overs and withholds. That is a factual fact and a hard bound rule. So not only a Wait, fact, a factual fact. Yes, yeah, factual fact. Say that. So slow. I'm like, good. so it's not a, it's not a fake fact or an unfact. It's a factual fact. So this is an example of how Hubbard, it, like he, he's like written more than anybody else. Dude hasn't edited shit ever mm -hmm. because like, this is a quote, a factual fact. Independent investigation found that he had been engaged in various unethical acts, such as making purchases without financial authorization, using another's credit card. That was when I bought the plane ticket. It was the credit card my ex-wife and I had. Yo, my name was on the card. Your credit card. <laughs> What yeah. Is, and when you're, cause I read this ahead of time. And so when you were relaying that story about the credit card, I was like, oh, that's going to be the credit card, isn't it? It's going to be the one yeah. that you share. And then using personal oh, property without permission. So the organization <laughs> didn't have a car for me to use for this print job I was out doing. So I was using my mother-in-law's like shitty old car to drive out to do this thing. So when I then went from the print job to, I drove to Ontario airport in Southern California and I parked it in long-term <laughs> parking. That was the property without permission is driving her car like to somewhere blow. not approved. Yeah. And then squirreling administrative policies and procedures in his area went on post is that when Dave threatened me about the laminating, that's what that's about. So the, oh my God. The, so the, the making purchases without financial authorization, that sounds pretty inflammatory, right? That sounds pretty <laughs> nasty. Can I explain to you what that would be? Yeah. So remember yeah. I was in charge of this on-demand print shop. Like we had these massive Xerox machines. We had a color Xerox machines and then these two black and white ones. And that we would have to run them around the clock. We would come out mm. with like the Philadelphia doctorate course in 12 languages. We would get that shit like the days before it was supposed to be released. And we run these things around the clock. 
in order to make it. And we're mm-hmm. binding them all and we're creating it all. And they have to run around the clock in order to get the stuff done. There's this thing called mm-hmm. math. They made us like learn it when we were cadets. Mm-hmm. It's reading, writing, and arithmetic. And when you add up how fast things print off and like number of hours in the day, you can find out like, fuck, we don't have enough time to do this, but we have to work around the clock. Yeah. So there's this thing called financial planning and you mm-hmm. submit purchase orders that says, hey, I need a Xerox technician to fix this shit when it breaks so that I can do the whole math thing that I was talking about. It's super confusing, mm-hmm. but bear with me. <laughs> so then when they don't pay the money for the maintenance technician to fix the shit that has to run around the clock, it breaks down. It, and this isn't something you can fix yourself. They have to be run by these computer technicians. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. Like, hey, we're available for you around the clock. You pay your amount. We come out and we fix it any time of the day or night. It doesn't matter. Well, they didn't cover it in FP and I'm supposed to work around the clock. Mm-hmm. So what do I do as a good Sierra member? I call the technician out. You got to fix the machine. Mm-hmm. I, I incurred mm-hmm. financial debt to the organization because it wasn't covered in financial planning, hence mm-hmm. a financial irregularity. So when they say independent investigation found that he had been engaged in various unethical acts, such as making purchases without financial authorization, that's what they're talking about. This is the grasping for straws bullshit on like, oh, fuck, this guy's been working his ass off for us for the last nine years. Shit. He's using somebody's credit card. It's kind of his, but fuck him. And uh, he's using (laughs) his property. And like, okay, dude, like, anyway. Well, you're not supposed to have before you can do. So they have all these Mm. policies that conflict with themselves that then they Mm -hmm. can just use to penalize you as they see fit. It's just all conditional bullshit. Yeah. So (laughs) within the CIRG, you know where we say a CIRG member is able to do any job, assign, train or not, had it or not, blah, 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 blah. And you're able to make it go right. This is all code for organizational inadequacy and lack of ability to manage. So if you actually had people that knew how to do their jobs and they were provided the resources to do so, it's actually pretty easy to get things done. But mm-hmm. the Sea Org will take somebody that's good at it, put them in an area, uh, good at a job, if they're successful at it, move them to another area that's non-productive, hoping they'll do better at that. And then a crazy thing happens when they're in an area that they're not good at. It's like taking your mom and saying, hey, she's a real successful artist. I need her to be in charge of of treasury because uh, we're having <laughs> financial problems and then wondering yeah, like, she wouldn't why, be good at that at all. Why, yeah. Why is KJ fucking up in treasury? Like it's, it's, it's fucking confusing to me. Like she was so sure. good before. Now she's a shit bag. Like this is the way they think from a raised in as a child perspective. Like you don't know any better, but I feel like adults mm-hmm. that know the real world should know that they're setting themselves up to fail with this crazy system. That's just is chasing its tail. I just like as a kid you don't know anybody like I have to achieve my thing but adults know better they know these systems are designed to fail right I don't get it so this is the cognitive dissonance that occurs with Sierra members Hubbard said these things thus they are true it's the same reason why they are watering like grass that doesn't grow in Southern California to keep it green like there's illogics built into things and it's because this guy said these things and they everything that he says is important as everything else that he said Mm. People who were successful contractors or managers from, you know, arguably from before they came in the Sea Org, they bring them in there and then they fall into this organizational structure that has illogic built into it. And then they're wondering why it's not working properly. Well, it's because, you know, the factual facts aren't factual (laughs) facts. Like this shit like that. Everything that this guy says, they hinge on everything as though it's all scripture. It's all like the red words in the Bible. Every meandering ass thought that Oran Hubbard has is all like Jesus said so for them. It's crazy. Prophecy. So now let's get on to my suppressive acts because they are scandalous. Let's Violation. Mike is guilty of the following suppressive acts. For real. But wait, your time track found you had a continued adherence to a person who's demonstrably guilty of suppressive acts and refuses to. That's just, probably my. Is that that's your dad? Probably my father that I then mm-hmm. like came into contact with that. when I had to blow and gotcha. he's now he had spoken out of against Scientology after he couldn't get his kid out. So it says a review of his time track found he has a continued adherence to a person who is demonstrably guilty of suppressive acts and refuses to, to disconnect. And then when you understand that it's actually your parent, it's not some person you're adhering to. It's like you've maintained <laughs> some kind of relationship with your father. <laughs> We don't enforce disconnection, but we're going to declare right. you. I'd never left. My father was butthurt about it. He spoke out about sci- against Scientology. He was declared. 
a suppressive person. I hadn't talked to him in the entire time I had been then in nine years at gold. Then when I mm. blow, I finally get in contact with him. He provides me a place to stay, helps me get back on my feet, helps me enlist in the military. And that, I guess, is what they're talking mm. about. Mike, and here's the thing is that's the thing that they'd been worried about for you way back when they were preparing you to join the Sea Org Forever because he line. was a means of an out. They don't want mm. that. They didn't want you to have a means yeah. of surviving on the outside. And so, and then it does come into fruition and they're, they're just mm -hmm. pissed off about it. That like, oh, he didn't become a burger flipping prostitute doing drugs on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard. He actually yeah. entered into the military and began a successful life for himself. So, well, I said some nasty shit to them before they ended up sending me this SP declare, which we'll get into in a little bit, but this is just so much fun to talk through. I love so that. then I these suppressive that. acts, number one, violation or neglect of any of the 10 points of keeping Scientology working. Oh my goodness. I like Aaron <laughs> Smith. Levin says, my pearls. Two, Sally, that could be anything. Like having the correct yeah. technology, knowing the technology. The fact that I remember this shit in like, oh, yeah. anyway, it's so knowing it is correct, teaching correctly the correct technology, applying the technology, seeing the technology is correctly applied, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a bunch of things that create a catch-22 situation where there's no right answer. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, unless you do exactly what Scientology says. And then number two, failure to handle or disavow or disconnect from a person demonstrably guilty of suppressive acts. That's, it's just my father yeah. who would uh, literally helped me just get back on my feet. Three, secretly planning to leave and making pr uh, private preparations to do so without informing the proper terminals and the organization and blowing and not returning within a reasonable length of time. So right here, it says you are not free to go on your own on your own terms and it's only on mm -hmm. our terms or we're mm -hmm. going to fucking excommunicate you. And then this is interesting here. And I want to point this out. This paragraph is very interesting for anybody that has a suppressive person declare because Scientology makes people sign a lot of fucking papers. They make them sign a lot of membership agreements. They make them sign a lot of things that give their rights away. Okay. They make them specifically say that if I ever have a beef with you, I'm going to not go to civil authorities. I'm going to let Scientology, I'm going to go back to my abuser in Scientology and I'm going to let them fucking sort it out because they know best. So there's a lot of paperwork that I kind of paraphrased and I'm being a little cheeky or tongue in cheek or however they say it down under. But this paragraph here, I just want to read this to you and get your thoughts about it. Any certificates or awards given to Mike are hereby canceled. Any trade my, trademark licenses or membership agreements he may have signed are also hereby canceled. And he may not use any of the Dynetics and Scientology trademarks in any manner whatsoever. It sounds a little like they just invalidated their own NDAs and arbitration agreements. Maybe that's why they're not actually issuing suppressive mm -hmm. person declares anymore. Because uh, I would love if they sued me. I have so many things to talk about. Be great. I love it. So, That's and, my feeling um, as well, Mike. My feeling as well. Yeah. But hey, what's great on YouTube is being able to comment on things. There's a lot of access to public documents and things of this nature. So YouTube is the thing that they can't deal with because it's actually, mm -hmm. there's a lot of allowances for it on, you know, when you can go in there and critique things and it's really no mm -hmm. issue. So it kind of well, gives around I mean, as well. Also, Mike, so many factual facts. And it's not those it's so... unfactual facts, which <laughs> because those are problematic, no. but the factual ones are the ones we're trying to focus on. Um, the unfactual facts is what psychiatry yeah. deals with. And that's not what we deal with in Scientology, okay? so Just the factual ones, yeah. Should Mike come to his senses and recant, he is to do steps A to E, given in HCO policy letter 23 December 1965, RB, suppressive acts, suppression of Scientology and Scientologists. His only Scientology terminal is the International Justice Chief via the Continental Justice Chief. Mm -hmm. And this is from the International Justice Chief for... Church of Scientology International, CSI, ME, and then whatever it says down there at the bottom. Mike Ellis and whoever, like other things. So this is them declaring me a suppressive person. And this is the whole mm -hmm. policy that kind of supports this whole thing. Here's the, this, the policy letter that you just pulled up talking about all this sort of stuff. This goes into what a PTS is, what a suppressive person is. And, and <clears throat> it's, it's a bunch of strange constructs that don't really mean shit. And mm -hmm. they're trying to say the idea that they have on a suppressive person is this absolutely evil person that wants to ruin everybody and everything and wants to see no one succeed. 
And really what they turn it into is anybody that has a beef or disagreement with Scientology or specifically exactly. David Miscavige is mm -hmm. then excommunicated to use, you know, another kind of church's wording for it. And you're made mm -hmm. so that you have no connection to anyone in Scientology. And this has, I think, been demonstrated more recently in all the media coverage of Scientology on how this actually works and how they weaponize this against their former members. We've spent all this mm -hmm. time talking about how heavily indoctrinated we all were as children. To then be told we're completely cutting you off from everyone you know and care about is devastating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You have literally felt like you are alone in the universe and you've been told your whole life that all of the bad in the world is being created by suppressive persons and now you are one. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of confusion that comes when that happens. It's, it, it's yeah. It freezes you for a really long time because you know it's coming. It's this thing hanging over you for decades that if you do this, then this will happen. This is a consequence and you know it's there and they're constantly threatening you with it. But I, I wonder like when you did blow, you left and you were like, fuck it, I'm going to go. Miriam was the same thing. She tried to run away. I routed out and was off, you know, to, well, banned from the base as a teenager and now homeless. Like we eventually made the decision to do it anyways. Like, fuck it, declare I don't know. I can't do this anymore. This is too painful. This life is too painful. So then were you concerned about your SP declare at that point? I think at this point when this arrived, when I got my SP declare, uh, when it actually arrived in the mail, I was in boot camp. I think my parents waited until I was done with boot camp and they gave it to me, but I was focused on like, I'm, I had almost like tried to completely compartmentalize everything yeah. that happened to me at that point. And I had this opportunity in front of me, which I was very well suited for as being indoctrinated mm -hmm. heavily as a cadet. I was now starting mm -hmm. military basic training and had a, a great opportunity in front of me. So I just drew a line down in my time track and put everything that happened behind me like it never happened. And mm -hmm. I just started my life from scratch. And there was a lot of almost imposter syndrome things that were going on because here I am as a 27 year old man in boot camp mm -hmm. with, there's a mm -hmm. variety of different ages, but a lot of them are younger kids. Mm -hmm. And I am this ultra focused, dedicated person. and military service for me after being in the Sea Org was easy in that going mm -hmm. through the training, like the physical requirements and the things to mm -hmm. learn were, were not easy, but the mental mm -hmm. stress was something less than I was used to. They were Absolutely. requiring me to eat, to sleep, to be on a schedule, to do like, to just follow orders. And when you do well, you get rewarded, you get paid. Like my first mm -hmm. paycheck as a private, I got 850 bucks. That is more money wow. than I've seen in my entire it's life. Ever. Yeah, totally. Wow. Like, like I was like, oh my God, it's so much money. And I look back at that now I'm and I'm rich. like, we're, we're only paying privates 850 bucks. So Mike, when you left, you went to your dad. Yeah. I had to reconnect with him. I'm the sure. process to find him wasn't easy. I had to find mm -hmm. that like one family mm -hmm. friend that never moves like that one old person that's mm -hmm. always like there and they knew oh, where, he was, where and he was. Then, was. Oh. So I left without knowing, like, if there was anybody at the other end of this plane ticket, I bought a one-way ticket to Denver. And then when I got there, started making phone calls, like trying to find where he was and was able to actually get a hold of my yeah. stepmom. And then wow. they came and picked me up. I had a 10 year old sister that I'd never met, mm -hmm. you know? So for the first six months, I was just resting, getting my kind of head straight and then figuring out what I wanted to do with myself. I had tried to like, hey, maybe I'll get into the printing industry. Maybe I'll do this. And I didn't enjoy any of those things. And I'm like, you know what? I had a better idea when I was 15 years old, what I wanted to do with my yes. life. So I just went on to that. And that's where I then joined service. I yeah. remember that really weird dissociative state when you're like in this weird flux between realities and trying to just like, because you think you're an adult and you're just, and you were at that point, you were 27 for flex sakes. This was like... What do you think your education was at that point? What level of education do you think you had as a 27 year old? Aside from my ability to read and because we had to read so much Hubbard, I was probably mm -hmm. at a high school level reading level, but my mathematics was really no different from when I left in the fifth grade, but I was mm -hmm. super good at construction. And I was also a okay. very determined and able, like I was a good driver. I was good at working heavy equipment. I've always been, I've always mm -hmm. had a knack for operating machinery and vehicles mm -hmm. and things of this nature, just something that very, it's been very easy for me. So, but I, but I had the one thing I had going for me was a tenacious work ethic and the mm -hmm. feeling that I had to make up for so much lost time. Mm -hmm. I had never had a drink of alcohol when I left. So, you know, like having my first like 
I remember when I was, and I'm not a big drinker. I do enjoy a beverage every once in a while, but I don't have a dependency issue on it. But to be 27 years old, never experiment with like having just a drink with family, like a glass of wine or something like that. So to get into the military, did you, were there pre-requirements for requisites or anything that you had to achieve or like so i left i had to fake a resume because i had no education i had no work history that was transferable that, that anyone would recognize so I, I made a fake resume now i understand going to the military that's probably not a saying they're going to check all this yeah. stuff out no was it was challenging? it was challenging because the first time so my father was in the marine corps when he was in vietnam so i was thinking like i'll join the marine corps and i'll go do what my mm -hmm. dad did so I actually went and talked to the Marine recruiters and this is what's strange. I went in there. I was very upfront with all of them about, Hey, this is where I'm at. This is the group that I came from. I'm very much want to serve. Mm -hmm. This Marine recruiter had experience with former Scientologists that were trying to join the Marine Corps. He's oh, like, yeah. he would not recruit me. He's like, I tried to recruit somebody from Scientology before you guys make substandard Marines and you're fucking psycho. He's like, I refuse oh, to no. let you in the Marine Corps. And I was like, oh, no. didn't even give me a chance. He didn't even let me do the test. This guy had such know. a bad taste in his mouth from somebody that he had dealt with. I have no idea who it was. The military does this thing. It's called the, the ASVAB, which is the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. It's just a, it's an aptitude test. They test you on where you are academically, and then they figure out what you're good at. Because what the military is good at, they're going to spend money on you to train you to do something. They're going to figure out what you're good at and what you have an aptitude for. And if you're dumb as a box of rocks, they're going to put you in a job that you're like, hey, here's, then it makes sense for you. So they don't put you in a job that you're going to fail at. And it makes, it mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense, you mm -hmm. know, just from a management perspective. So I go and I talk mm -hmm. to the army recruiters and it's during the global war on terror when it's all kicking off and they were struggling to make quotas. So the guy was willing to talk to me and I'm like, look, man, just give me a chance to go and do the tests and all this stuff. So I did the test and I scored unbelievably high on all the aptitude tests and I kind of qualified. So all I had was this GED and, but I had, and I, but I tested extremely high and he's like, you qualify for a lot of different jobs. And I was like, well, I want to be a pilot. And he's like, you don't qualify to be a pilot. You have to actually have like, there are pathways to become a pilot, but you can't be a pilot. You could be, but you can get into aircraft maintenance. So mm -hmm. I was like, great. I want to work on aircraft. So I signed up, I joined the military. And, and I was able to slowly work my way into, I did a tour of duty as an aircraft mechanic and was able to go through the process and the education and training to then later be able to apply for warrant officer candidate school and to become a warrant officer instructor or the uh, helicopter pilot. And that's what I've been doing ever since in the military. So, uh, but military service for me, given that I came from the C organization, the demands of a military lifestyle were easier than the demands of a Sea Org lifestyle. So when we reference that for raising children, mm -hmm. if you want to raise your children in the Sea organization, they would be easier to raise them in the active duty military than it would be to raise them in the Sea organization. I'll tell you that right now. Like it's going to wow. provide them better opportunities and they'll be treated better than a Sea Org. Mm -hmm. Like, then that was my experience as an adult going from one to the other. So let's kind of go back a little bit in time to pre mm -hmm. Mike being declared. I had just blown again. So I blew on 17 October, 2003. And this letter was sent to me on 25 October, 2003. So about a week, a little over a week later. And this is from oh. <clears throat> my ex-wife, um, Samantha. And it says, dear Mike, hey, I want you to know that I have told everything. The language, getting... I'm sorry, is so difficult. I like, I just feel like I'm in a concessional no. right now. It's like, so, mm -hmm. and, and, and this will make sense as to why it sounds like that, I think, because she quite literally was, and this, she's being coached on what she's yes. to write, but you can read between the lines and it, it actually tells a lot here. I have been getting some intensive sec checking over the last week. And I want you to know that what I did, what we did was out ethics. This is the conversation that we had with regard to wanting to blow. About leaving. Um, this is the out ethics that we've been talking about, okay? I've gotten my own head together on this, and I am undergoing certain handlings. There are no secrets anymore. Like, okay, cool. At this mm -hmm. point, I can only ask, beg, and plead that you come to your senses and route out properly. You must, for your own sake, underlined, Think about your future. You cannot ignore all that Scientology has done for you, all that, all that you have done for Scientology. 
all of your wins auditing have not been for naught. Please, you do not want to disconnect yourself from Scientology. You do not want to, exclamation point. Mm -hmm. I spoke to your mom. You cannot ignore her and all that she has done for you. She has been getting some auditing. She is quite upset. She told me that she keeps hoping that you will reach down deep into your own sanity and make it back. Don't forget, we still have our own end to clean up and sort out, and that will be done in LA. So at this point, they're saying, we're not going to let you come back to end. I'm mm. like, I don't really want to anyway, but anyway, that's, that, that's what's being said there. We'll be done in LA. It won't be done in end. And they did the similar thing to Val Haney. Remember, they made her come back to route out and they kept her locked up in LA while they sucked the shit out of her. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's kind of the same thing. Anyway, should you decide not to come back at all, I am prepared to disconnect entirely, as was stated in our last calm. And, I, and there might have been another letter, but I don't know if that, if I actually have that or not. At least come back for your own cleanup. You don't have much time left to make that decision. Mike, I hope you listen to me on this one. ML, Samantha Brown. So she's still signing her last name as Brown at this point. Mm -hmm. So this is... Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I see here is I blew, and Mark Headley was actually her boss at this point. So he and I still need to talk mm -hmm. through the specifics of like, what was the impact mm -hmm. of Mike leaving? Because I was very much an installation, even though when I, after I was in RTC, I still worked on security matters. And I was a, still a trusted person there. There were like when there would be intruder drills and things of this nature, like they would kind of deputize people. And I was one of those people that they always relied on. So for me to just up and leave, I think it really, they weren't expecting it. And it was, it was a lot, but you can see that they then oh. pulled her in and started sex checking her. Right. Mike, I think it's very clear in your declare order because they're like, he was doing secret and everything secret. And she mentioned secrets again. So it's really clear that they were very surprised and very shocked that you departed in the way that you did. So there's one person that is responsible for me leaving, and I could not be more thankful for this person to help me actually get to the point I am at today. And that is David Miscavige. If it wasn't for the <laughs> fact that he is such an unbelievable asshole and that he was so rude to both me and her, I would probably mm -hmm. still be working there to this day. I would probably be still at that international base or down at Scientology Media Productions or the RPF in LA or something. But the only thing that was keeping me there was Samantha. And mm -hmm. when her reality departed so greatly from mine in terms of the way that I saw our relationship, I realized that, like, what am I staying here for? I work around the clock. We're being told we're shitheads all the time. Like, I don't want to do mm -hmm. this anymore. And I was also, and I was also getting older. Like, hey, I'm 27 mm -hmm. years old. Like, I have goals for myself. If I don't get out of here soon, I'm going to be stuck here. So, yeah. Yeah. Very smart. I'm glad so you guys so were married for like nine years. Yeah. Wow. I just look at it and I go, I have told everything. I am being sec checked. There are no secrets. Mm -hmm. For your own sake, for, dig into your own sanity. It's just so. So for know. a couple that's been, for a couple that's been married and if like, let's say that, let's say for mm -hmm. some reason, like, uh, your spouse decides to just, Hey, I'm, I'm moving out. You'd call them and you say, what the hell is going on? And you would talk to mm -hmm. like the two of you would talk back and forth and you'd have, have this conversation. discussion, but mm -hmm. there's this weird middleman, which is this organization that controls everything. And it's like, Hey, you're not letting the organization control you. And this is a huge problem. And we don't know what to do about it. You have to come back and let them control you. That's how this reads like, Hey, they've gotten me. I've been receiving intensive sex checking. Do you know what that means? Sitting in that room, just getting fucking grilled like for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, she says it right there. It's not like I'm interpreting mm -hmm. all of it. No, no absolutely. Right. Let's, let's see. I'm first going to cover the, the letter that I wrote, which is to this guy, Bruce Wagner. He was the legal director at Golden Arrow Productions in the port captain's office. This is kind of their Div 6. The way it works up at the Ent Base and at Golden Arrow Productions, OSA International, the Office of Special Affairs, they operate down in Los Angeles. They don't have a whole lot of jurisdiction up at the international base. They're utilized sometimes, but they don't actually have a lot of control up there. So when legal affairs have to be handled, it's handled very closely through this port captain's office who is kind of the OSA for Golden Era Productions. And then they coordinate with the legal, 
representatives and the lawyers that OSA has. There are some OSA staff that come up to the international base, mainly that Kirsten Katano, whatever her last name is this month, Peterson chick. But other than that, a lot of that's handled by this. You're going to see this name Bruce, and that's Bruce Wagner. I think he ended up getting out and himself and was like doing some shady stuff with seniors or something at some point. But I don't, anyway, we don't have to get into that right now. But I write to him and I write to him and say, Dear Bruce, I am to receive a few items from Golden Era and from IJC, but I am unable to fully disconnect due to the basic legal matters that are pending. I have received two disconnection letters from my wife, Samantha, one written and one typed. I have received a suppressive person declare from your organization, decided to issue on me after I uh, continued to try to contact my wife. So I had been writing letters back to Samantha. I had like returned some of her things that I had gotten and had a letter stuffed inside of it. I was trying to get word to her to try to see if I could get her to leave. And I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so this is my letter back to them. And I wasn't a great writer at the time. Again, I referenced my fifth grade level of education. So I want very much for Samantha to come to her senses and leave and come with me. As far as I uh, can tell, this might still be her plan. I have not received any divorce papers that are legal, that are legally binding documents. All I can assume is that she is being held against her will. In my view, this is a human rights violation along with every instance of mail fraud that occurs when mail is open, staff are made to get abortions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Your organization walks a very fine line every single day. While your organization preaches freedom, I see that it, like so many other religious groups, only wants the money to continue to control people. When one disagrees with your system, he or she is then a trouble source and a danger. So I guess by this rationale, I am very much suppressive. I want personal freedom in my own life and family and children, and most of all, my future of my own design. I now ask, why have I been sent your propaganda, disconnection letters, suppress a person, declare, but no divorce papers. If it's not written, it's not true. Like one of the quotes from L. Ron Hubbard, one of his meandering mm -hmm. bullshit statements that they hang, if it's not written, it's not true. It's like one of these like indoctrination mantras that you always hear there. I have a marriage mm -hmm. cert. I have a notarized letter from my wife along uh, with other signed papers uh, that consents to my military career. I'd gotten them to sign some things because I was going into the military and then she even signed them and sent them back. So I was like, what the fuck is going on? Um, mm -hmm. You, however, have not bothered to even send divorce papers. If I do not receive a legal divorce papers, I will make every effort, both legally and personally, to contact Samantha and get her out of there. She can only be sent to so many places. The Golden property, the ranch, pack or flag. I can get to any of these locations within a few hours if need be. I know that Rosemary was sent to the PAC RPF and has been working in the mill there. I also predicted this would be done. It's your call. And then I signed it private, <laughs> Mike R. Brown, United States Army I Aviation Corps, which is the cheesiest fucking signature funny. block that you could ever. <laughs> this is just me like trying to assert dominance over these fucking asshole people. After 20... Um, seven plus years it's so brilliant so, i love it so then so then the answer that i get is to the left of this <clears throat> which is from my mother yeah. which is you know to 12 september 2004 about a month later dear michael do your ade steps and get back into good standing with the church i will not be in calm with you until this is done rosemary like yeah. i asked her about this because i still had it when she came out and she said she was on the rpf she <laughs> had People standing over her to make her write this. And she yeah, said this is the hard yeah. one of the hardest things that she's ever written. So she is not proud about it. But this just goes to show you the inhumanity that goes into this. It's not signed. She would always sign mom, you know. She oh, at least yeah. said, Dear Michael. I'm sure that they wanted her to just say Michael. But this is mm -hmm. about as you have a person in a thought reform camp that is being made to then write this. Oh, That's the way that reads to me. Chinese yeah. prison camp. Yeah. And then the A to E is basically you recant that you are wrong. Everything you've said is wrong. Everything you've done is wrong. And then you do an amends and you rat out anyone that helped you. Right? And then you become a Scientologist a again. This is the letters that I've received through this process where I'm trying to, I'm trying to contact my wife. You know, I didn't, I wasn't able to get her out. I was trying to figure out what the hell is going on. I'm, I'm like writing to this. I'm trying to write to her and I'm getting responses from the organization. I'm not getting mm -hmm. responses from her. We were never able to... We were ne never able to sit down from each other and say, okay, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. Do you want to come with me or not? Okay, I want to stay. Okay, great. Then we're probably going to need to separate. I'm like, I don't want to do this, but if you're not going to come with me, I'm definitely leaving and you're going to stay. 
okay, well, then we should get a divorce. This is what normal fucking people would do. They would sit down mm -hmm. from each other and say, you know what? This isn't working for me. It's either we're going to totally. do this together and we're going to make a go of it. It's never between yeah. the two people. The answers that I'm getting to all these communications are coming from the international justice chief and from Bruce Wagner. Because the C organization knows that two humans talking together will work things out or influence each other or whatever. And so they have to intervene and control the narrative and interrupt the human interaction because right, the human because interaction is a danger to them. For an organization that prides themselves on being able to communicate, they are unable to have a nuanced conversation about mm -hmm. disagreements in a civilized manner and come up with mm -hmm. a, at least a shared agree to disagree sort of level of understanding with one another. You could sit down and you can say, okay, well, let's talk this over. You do this with your boss or you do this with your coworkers, you do this with your spouse. That mm -hmm. would violate the, the indoctrination so they can't afford it. So Mike, we talked about Steve Hassan's book, Combating Cult Mind Control. Um, it was his dad who was able to get him out of the Moonies. They did that through conversation. Two humans talking, it's so dangerous. Um, yeah. Yes, there is nothing more dangerous than a conversation in terms of the Sea Org and Scientology. It can't stand up to any level of scrutiny. Perfect. That is demonstrated over and over again. And all of these documents just literally show that entire process, that they are terrified mm -hmm. of personal interaction with people. Trafficking of children involves recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, receipt of children for the purpose of exploitation. Child exploitation may involve forced labor, slavery, servitude, debt bondage. Child labor is a form of work that may be hazardous to the physical, mental, spiritual, moral, or social development of children. And it can interfere with education, development, and psychological well-being. If you or someone that you know has been human trafficked, help is available. There will be more information at the end of this presentation. Thank you.